Hello, friends. Welcome. My name is Bonnie Schmidt, and I'm so glad that you're here. I am a NEAR Sciences Master Trainer, and NEAR stands for Neuroscience, Epigenetics, Adverse Childhood Experiences, and Resilience. And I'm honored to be here today as your host for this training on neuroscience and the impacts of trauma on brain development. All of the information that you will see here today, including the slides, come from the program ACE Interface. I am excited to get started, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here for you. So I left my email address here. If you have any questions at all about this presentation or the near sciences, please feel free to reach out and contact me at any time. I also want to say a heartfelt thank you to the Clallam Resilience Project and to Kitsap Strong for all of the incredible work they are doing to build resilience within their communities. So I'm going to share with you the findings from the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. So we are going to call it the ACE study. And that ACE study confirms with scientific evidence that adversity early in life increases physical, mental, and behavioral problems later in life. The ACE study is the largest study of its kind with over 17,000 participants. It was developed and co-sponsored by Kaiser Permanente, which of course is a managed care consortium out of San Diego, California, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia in the early 1990s. So Dr. Vincent Flitti, who you see here on the right, and Dr. Robert Anda are the co-principal investigators of the ACE study. Now, Dr. Anda, who designed the ACE study while he was working as a senior scientist at the CDC, has reviewed and approved all the information from the study that I'll share with you for this presentation. And Dr. Martin Teacher of Harvard University, who is not shown here, reviewed and approved all of the brain science facts that I'll be sharing as well. So from that first spark of life, as your cells start to divide and form that beautiful tiny beating heart of yours and your fragile skeletal structure and your central nervous system, the experience of being in relationship with another person and with the world around us has such a profound impact on who we are and who we will become. And although we can recall and describe with words a lot of what's happened in our lives, the memory of human experience is actually stored in our bodies and not just our minds. The human central nervous system connects us to ourselves, to other people, and to the world around us. So before I introduce the ACE study, I wanted just to explain a little bit about brain development. I am such a science geek and I love neuroscience and I just think it's so amazing that we're alive in a time on the planet right now when we have access to all of this amazing new profound information. It just brings so much of what I think we've really known intuitively for so long together with the science to really impact and support resilience. So I'm so excited to share this information with you. So the central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord, and they integrate all of our amazing senses and information from receptors located throughout our beautiful human body. Central nervous system regulates internal body functions and it manages elaborate chemical and electrical signaling. So your nervous system considers sensory input in the context of each and every second, almost instantaneously. And a good example of that is if you think about, you know, if you accidentally touch something that's really hot, how incredibly quickly you're able to pull your hand away, right? And this response and reaction is because of the elaborate intricacy and efficiency of your nervous system. So it really helps us to determine our understanding of and respond to the world that we live in. So your cells in the nervous system are called neurons and they are stunningly effective at processing and transmitting information. And they have a really central purpose in doing so, which is to adapt in ways that help to keep us alive. <laughs> so the main job of our whole body, right, is to help us survive. So what you're looking at here is something called synaptic density. And on the far left, we see a set of brain cells or neurons and what they might look like at the time of birth. Babies are born with the connections that they need at that point in life. 
And most of the wiring, or wiring of our brains occurs then as a result of life experiences, right? And a lot of that is happening in the womb and then just grows and grows once we are out in the world. So by age six, those same brain cells now have so many connections and you can see them there, right? So the wiring of the brain or the making of all of these complex neural networks is experience dependent. So whatever gets experienced the most in life then tends to lead to more robust connections between those nerve cells that form up those exact networks. And this is a process called branching or arborization. And you can kind of see that effect there on the screen. So a colleague of mine explained this in a way that I found really easy to understand and that I wanted to share with you. So Imagine that you've gone into your backyard and you're driving your car around in the same place over and over again in your grass, right? We've all seen yards that have been turfed like this. And what would happen, right? You know, um, yes, like there's all those deep ruts that get created in the grass. And that's really similar to how your neural connections work. So the more we drive around in one spot, the more similar experiences we have, the more that those pathways then are strengthened, the deeper those ruts get, right? So the last section on the slide on the right represents around age 14, about the time of puberty. So you'll notice that there are now fewer connections between the brain cells than there were at age six. And this is because the least experienced connections, those roads that we're not driving on as much, tend to withdraw at around the time of puberty. So this process is called pruning, where the neural connections literally die off and this phenomenon helps to really explain why neglect or not getting the experiences that we need uh, for nurturing can have such a powerful negative impact on health and social functioning. So with his team at Harvard and McLean Hospital, Dr. Teacher learns about the human brain and biology through a systematic process. And what he does is so fascinating. He isolates one factor at a time. And what he does is he compares the brains of people who have experienced neglect or abuse to the brains of people who have not. And what his findings suggest is that maltreatment affects brain development in predictable ways and that not all experience generates the same effect. And why that is important is because what is predictable is preventable. So there are at least three known variables that determine the effects of maltreatment, including the type of maltreatment, gender, and your age at the time of maltreatment. So one of those elaborate systems in your amazing brain is your limbic system. And this is located in the mid or mammal brain that you'll see there on the left. And the brain region in the limbic system controls many things, including physical balance, internal temperature regulation, digestion. The limbic system also plays a really key role in your body's ability to be able to regulate hormones, regulate mood, heartbeat, and sexual behavior. So the limbic system is super crucial for learning and memory and reward and reinforcement. And they're all processes that help us to stay on a really healthy track. The limbic system also has an incredibly important role in the fight or flight response to danger. So here you'll see the hippocampus and amygdala, which are two regions in the limbic system that are vital for forming healthy relationships. They are the centers for affect and attention, helping to make us, uh, help us make meaning from social cues and language and help us to remember verbal and spatial information. And these regions also regulate panic and fear and a whole range of emotional responses. And they really also work to help us put the brakes on an emotional outburst when we need to do that as well. So we know now from this research that the hippocampus and the amygdala are vulnerable to all forms of maltreatment in the first three years of life and sexual abuse through age five. But the effects of the maltreatment may not be seen for another nine to 13 years. And here's why. This is because at birth, the hippocampus has granule or seedling cells that are biologically programmed to grow and mature around puberty in adolescence. 
So delayed symptoms from toxic stress can occur because stress hormones like cortisol kill off the seedling cells. So when the cells are killed, the effect and impact can't be seen until years later when they then fail to grow and produce the brain mass needed for that specialized functioning. Another brain region with seedling cells is the cerebellar vermis. And this is the part of the brain which connects the two halves of the cerebellum. You can see it there on your screen. So the vermis is something that helps us to move through our physical environment and really helps us to perceive peripheral details in the world around us. Uh, it's the part of our brain that pays attention to what a group of strangers is doing, right? Standing at the side of the road um, or what they might do even while we continue to walk in a forward path towards our destination. So it's no surprise that one consequence of maltreatment is attention problems, including attention deficit disorder, uh, which is ADD, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD. The vermis is also the part of the brain that regulates the release of our feel-good brain chemistry, including the release of hormones like norepinephrine and dopamine, those feel-good chemicals, right? Your joy juice. So research on abuse in this region show not only reduced size of the vermis, actual size, but a decreased blood flow and functionality to this area as well. So uh, with limited access to positive feelings, it's not entirely surprising that impacts to this region can also lead to vulnerability for depression and substance abuse. So the vermis is sensitive to all forms of maltreatment just before puberty, and symptoms may not fully emerge until early adulthood. The vermis may be the seat of mental health, and it has a role in virtually every mental illness, including schizophrenia, borderline personality disorder, and depression. So we're only beginning to really understand the biological connections between trauma-induced adaptations in the vermis and serious and persistent mental illness. So now to bring some light to this neuroscience, there is amazing research spearheaded by Dr. Bruce Perry, who does research in the area of the neurosequential model of therapeutics. His research highlights that if we know which areas of the brain have been impacted by trauma, then we can determine what those areas of the brain need in order to heal. And there are certain things that we know different parts of the brain love and need in order to grow. Things like cross-body movement and yoga and mindfulness practices. So we can then prescribe things for individuals who have experienced adversity to help heal the areas of the brain that were impacted. This incredibly hopeful body of research comes on the hinges of the scientific understanding that our brains are malleable, right? That we can literally rewire our brains towards more resilience. So every person's life is of course unique, but for illustration and for our conversation today, we're just going to imagine together two different worlds. One is mean and dangerous, and the second is kind and generous. And traumatic experience during development, like abuse, neglect, and chaotic relationships, generates predictable patterns of how brains develop, their architecture and behavior and traits. So humans are really only made to be under stress for about 20 minutes at a time, just long enough to prepare for a fight or to hide, right? So experiences that cause stress chemicals to be continuously produced and pumped into your body, for example, child abuse, neglect, or even being in a war zone can have a really big impact on development. So under the circumstances, our bodies tend to prepare for life in a dangerous world. So stress hormones have a lot of influence on cells and chemicals and wiring, and they work to sculpt brains that are wired for certain, certain circumstances, like being edgy or hot-tempered, being impulsive and hypervigilant, or being withdrawn and dissociated and numb. And this is the path outlined on the top of the slide. So for example, people who have had traumatic stress from conception to the toddler years 
uh, will likely have a higher baseline of stress hormones like cortisol in their bodies. And as a result, these folks may end up having a very short fuse, might be a little bit more self-focused, and may have a difficult time shifting gears from emotion to actual problem solving. Because if there's more danger just around the corner, being focused on other people around them, other things around them, and thinking through options would not contribute to their survival, but readiness for next danger would. But the downside to that is when stress hormones like cortisol hang around for a long time and they're actually toxic to your brain cells. So this toxicity makes it difficult for brain cells to develop healthy neural networks and even can cause brain cells to die. So that's why we call a continuous stress, trauma, and episodic uh, predictable stress, toxic stress. And Dr. Teacher calls the lower path in this diagram, the benevolent world path. The world is kind, easygoing, helpful, and free from the traumatic stress we were talking about on the path above. So people growing up on this benevolent world path are way more likely to develop a brain with cells and wiring and chemistry for being focused, flexible, and relationship oriented. So one common belief in our society is that the people whose experience takes them on the top path, that mean and dangerous path, are maladaptive. And the people along the bottom path are adaptive. And that's just untrue. Both of those pathways are adapted. Both brains are adapting to their experience and did exactly what they needed to do in order to survive their conditions. And that's a good thing for us as a species because the people whose brains adapt to a dangerous or a stressful world are more likely to survive when it's tough. And the people whose brains adapt to a safe world are likely to be prepared to meet society's expectations in calm times. Our experiences in turn get wired into our biology. So Dr. Teacher says when it's our, when our biology actually collides with all of those societal expectations that we have for people that this is where we really run into trouble, right? So consider if you put a person from that benevolent world path into the chaotic and turbulent environment of say riot control, that person might really, really struggle unless they've learned some incredibly specific skills to survive that situation. And likewise, a child that's adapted to a dangerous and stressful world may not be able to sustain patience, right? They might not share or cooperate or use words as their first choice. And then when that kiddo comes to school and we ask them to sit still and to share and to, co to cooperate, right? Uh, there can be a really painful disconnect that's super hard for everyone involved. Uh, the child will have to be actively taught the skills required to succeed in the context just as we would train a person from the benevolent path how to act in a chaotic and dangerous environment. There's a literal boot camp to prepare people for being in chaotic and dangerous environments, right? And the question that I ask of all of us is where is the boot camp for the children who grew up in the mean and dangerous world path that we are then asking to meet all of these societal norms? So we've talked about sensitive developmental periods when toxic stress has profound effects on human development. But these childhood times are also incredible windows for opportunity, for building resilience. After all, the developing brain is sensitive to all kinds of experience, right? So by paying attention to these sensitive developmental times, we can do such a better job protecting protecting children and providing them with the kinds of challenges and supports that will remediate those earlier periods of toxic stress and give them a buffer that promotes lifelong health and well-being. So we have a collective choice together. We can actively develop skills and accommodations that enable everyone to contribute to their community, or we can continue our societal pattern of rejecting people when they have normal adaptive responses to childhood adversity. 
So if you remember only one thing from this presentation, I hope that it will be that toxic stress can be hardwired into biology. So before we assume that a person's behaviors really are a rebellious choice, let's think about and open our hearts to the possibility that adversity may be at the core of the challenges that we see. So thank you so much to all of you for being here with me today. I am so honored to just be here to share this information. If you have any questions at all, please reach out to us at www.clawlemresilienceproject.org and we will be happy to answer any questions that you have. I hope that this finds you well and that you are having a beautiful day. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here with me today. Bye.